7 through 15. We'll pray together and ask God to open up this text to us today. Lord, as we consider such a weighty text of how you are going to draw all of recorded history to a conclusion, we pray that our hearts would be open and our minds would be alert, uh, that we would be careful to hear what you say to your church, and Lord, be obedient to all you command us in Jesus' name. From Revelation chapter 20. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, start us out today reminding us of where we are and understanding that we are certainly now in that part of the book that ought to be considered future as John today is going to be talking about Satan's little season which is after the millennial reign of Christ. We understand the millennial reign of Christ to have begun in the first century at his resurrection and ascension to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He was enthroned as the king of heaven and earth at that time. And John has at the end of the millennials a thousand years, which is pretty much from the ascension of Christ till the end of the age, that Satan is going to be loose and begin to deceive the nations as he had prior to the enthronement of Christ. Now, at this point, the reader might be tempted to ask the question, well, why should God let Satan out of prison? After this long period of the ascendancy of the church and the spreading of the gospel, why would God at that point allow Satan out of prison? But all such questions require speculation that the reader is not to exercise. In my understanding, as a reader of the scripture, it's okay to have questions pop into our minds. We have that happen. We ought to make a distinction between questions that pop into our mind and accusations that we bring against God as if we know better how to draw history to a conclusion than God does. Instead, we ought to say, oh God, give me the humility as a reader of your book to read it in such a way that I believe that you are good. But I make this con I'll give you this consolation. The Bible has no devil on the first page and no devil on the last page. Now, admittedly, there is an epic battle for the souls of people on almost every page in between. But John is in this section going to write of the devil's last desperate grasp to, un the, to un upend the kingdom. Recall in chapter 12, the red dragon, the devil, had sought to devour the child that was born of the woman who would rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's Jesus Christ. He appeared in the form of the red dragon, and he had two surrogate beasts. He had the beast of the sea, the Roman Empire, and he had the beast of the land, apostate Israel. And at the end of Christ's millennial reign, a kingdom in which he has been gathering untold billions of trophies of grace. That's what we are, right? We're trophies of grace that have been gathered into his kingdom. At that point, for a short season, Satan is again going to be loosed out of his prison house to deceive the 
nations. St. Augustine, in his book, City of God, wrote this, For this persecution, occurring while the final judgment is imminent, gives us our timeline and chronology of it, shall be the last which shall be endured by the Holy Church throughout the world. Gog and Magog are not to be understood of some barbarous nations in some part of the world, for John marks that they are spread over the whole of the earth. Okay? Now, I have sought to warn you in this series against those who are insistent on being hyper-literalist with every part of the text in a text and literature um, style that is clearly meant to be taken as symbolic. I demonstrated this recently with the final battle being at Armageddon. Remember, the Hebrew word for mountain is par, and at Megiddo is where good King Josiah had died. What John does is he takes people, places, and events out of the Old Testament and reapplies them in his New Testament situation. Because Armageddon, the Mount of Megiddo, is where good King Josiah had died, it becomes a time of national mourning every year that they commemorated the death of Josiah as Pharaoh King Necho is trying to make his way up through Israel to interfere in the battle between Babylon and Assyria. Josiah seeks to block that passage through his nation, winds up dying. It becomes a source of national mourning every year, and John reapplies national mourning and military defeat to his own day. Likewise, Gog and Magog should not be looked for on some map. This reference to Gog and Magog is pulled from Ezekiel 38. Scholars are not real sure what the original reference was even to. Some have suggested that they were northern tribes who had invaded Palestine somewhere between 630 and 600 BC. That's the opinion of pulpit commentary. Others say that it was the Maccabees defeat by the Syrians in the 2nd century B.C. That's David Chilton in Paradise Restored. That's his opinion. But whatever the original usage of Gog and Magog were, John is going to reapply it to the idea that they are the enemies of God broadly and generically. Gog and Magog are the broad, generic code word for the enemies of God. This short period of Satan's spiritual deception should not be confused with the Great Tribulation, which John had dealt with prior in the form of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Those are historic. Those are completed. Those were the wars of the Romans and the Jews from 66 to 70 AD. What John is referring to now is the yet future conflict that Satan will have with the church at the end of the age after the millennial reign of Christ. Even those who are optimistic about the glorious golden age at the end of the millennium, we acknowledge Ezekiel's prophecy that there's going to be a mixture of blessing along with the curse. We acknowledge not every individual will be godly even at the end of the millennium. For example, listen to how Ezekiel, again in apocalyptic terms, I'm going to flesh that out for you, in apocalyptic terms is going to talk of the mixture of blessing and curse even at the end of the millennium. Water is issuing from below the threshold of the temple. You'll hear that language in coming weeks in the Revelation. Toward the east, where the temple faced east, the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. This water flows toward the eastern region and goes down into the Araba and enters the sea. When the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. I was talking about it has the imagery of the life-giving source water of God flowing from his throne out of the temple towards the Dead Sea, which you know is also known as salt sea. And the, the imagery is that it is going to be so cataclysmic of a change that God is going to change the salt sea into fresh water. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. Water goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything
thing will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Inaglame, it will be a place with a spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the fish of the great sea. That's the Mediterranean. But its swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They are to be left for the salt. So in this odd and apocalyptic literature, what Ezekiel is saying is, there's coming a day in which the power-changing nature of the gospel is going to go out from the temple of God, out from the eastern door of the temple, and that fresh water, and he utilizes language of many fish, and the fishermen having great success, so many fish in the salt sea, that it would be likened unto the Mediterranean Sea. It's a time of great outpouring of abundance of God's good favor and people coming into the kingdom. And yet, notice the last line, how he acknowledges there will be places that are marshes and swamps. And they're still going to be salty. And that's who Gog and Magog are in this final attempt at the overthrow of the kingdom. These swamps and marshes that have been left in salt are now prevailed upon by the great deceiver to once again attack the church. And they're not few in number. For we read that they are as numerous as the sands of the sea. So clearly, there will be a great number of ungodly, even at that time, of great blessing and great rejuvenation and great restoration that is to be spread throughout all the earth. The reference to Gog and Magog encompassing the beloved city, I mean verse 9, should not be understood as Jerusalem literally, but meant to convey the church universal, the whole church militant. For that is who Satan is going to attack at his last desperate attack against the kingdom. He's going to attack the church universal. Recall that this is John's pattern in the whole of his book, where Jezebel did not mean that ancient queen in the north, but instead referenced the Nicolaitan heresy at one of the churches. Where Sodom, Egypt, Babylon, and the prostitute did not mean any of these things literally, but Jerusalem symbolically. Likewise here, the camp of the saints in the beloved city should not be understood to be Jerusalem particularly or literally, but the church universally on all the earth. Because Gog and Magog are spread out over all the earth, they are going to come against all the church at the end of age. Now, it should come as no surprise that this final attack at the end of the millennial reign is leveled against the church. But here's a curiosity. Does it not seem strange to you that mankind would rebel after having had such a golden age, this age which Ezekiel prophesies the waters going out, and so many godly blessings in which he pictures under the imagery of multitudes of fish at that time, they should decide to rebel? My answer is this. This is nothing more than the pattern that we have always seen in the Bible. Mankind uniting in rebellion against God is as old as Nimrod at the Tower of Babel. You know today, if you call someone a Nimrod, you're calling them Nimrod was a man who said to the people of the plains of Shinar, Come gather around me. We will build a tower to the heavens. We will build something that reaches to the heavens and build a lasting name for ourselves. And yet that enormous structure only served as a lasting monument to the foolishness of all such rebellion as God confused their language and scattered them in a multitude of differing directions. And I could offer up a multitude of historical examples of the same maddening attempt of collective rebellion against God. And therefore, it's not really a surprise that Satan should come at the church after he has been loosed from his prison at the end of the thousand years. He will come with the salty swamps and marshes to rebel against the kingdom at the last in order to have one last desperate attempt to destroy the kingdom of God. But this last and final attempt of humanism's foolish self-exaltation will fare no better than that abandoned and disintegrated tower that lies somewhere buried under the
the sands of the plains of Shinar. The plainest reading of verse 9 is before any real battle is engaged, God will send fire down from heaven and devour the enemies of God. Now, whether one takes the fire literally or figuratively matters little, but I will tell you that Paul speaks in similar language in 2 Thessalonians. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. <coughs> they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because of the testimony to you was believed. So the Apostle Paul speaks of similar language. As Gog and Magog have made their last, final attempt at battle against God's church, God sends fire down from heaven, and as St. Augustine said, at that time the judgment is imminent. Tell you even today, all the glorious institutions humanists hold forth to show their strength, to boast how great they are, it will be like every boasting Nimrod. One day, the glorious King of Heaven is going to lay them all low. That tower that once humans boasted of cannot now even be identified, even by archaeologists, and so it will be of every human institution that sought to boast itself outside the person of Jesus Christ, lost in the sands of history they would be. Now John, in this section, is full of imagery of fire falling down upon the enemies of God from several blocks of chapters in Ezekiel. I'll give you one quick example. Ezekiel 39. I will send fire on Magog and those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. My holy name will make known in the midst of the people of Israel. And I will not let my holy name be profaned any more. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is coming. It will be brought about, declares the Lord God. This, that is the day of which I have spoken. Even as prior, we saw several instances in which fire fell upon those who had persecuted uh, the church. It had fallen upon Jerusalem as a type. We're now seeing the fulfillment as God is also sending fire upon the enemies of God worldwide as the antitype. Now, this is why I tell you I am sympathetic with those who read the book of Revelation and they're constantly reading into the world, into the world, into the world. They read into the world almost from chapter 4 onward. I'm sympathetic, and you know why? Because John utilizes parallel language, fire falling down from heaven, on the judgment that fell in the first century against apostate Judaism and Jerusalem, with the same language he uses at the end of the age of fire falling down the enemies of God, Gog and Magog, at the end of the age. Now, when you read this section, what do you think? Well, surely, protection of God's people. God is protecting us from our enemies by sending fire down from heaven. But notice the line verse 7. My holy name will I make known in the midst of my people. Yeah, it's in the Ezekiel passage. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. And that day, after Satan's little season, all will know one true God who delivers his people from all their enemies. This final hopeless grab of power by Satan will be met with total annihilation of the church's enemy. And so this cataclysmic judgment will make God evident in his church with his name never to be profaned again. Remember how the beast had, had blasphemous names upon his forehead? And today, there are many named Nimrods who have many blasphemous things to say. I tell you, as surely as this prophecy is true, there is coming a day in which God is going to rip all the blasphemies out of all the foolish Nimrod's mouths. It will never be uttered again. It will never be heard again. The Church of Jesus Christ will never again have to endure hearing our great God being blasphemed. So the enemies of God
God are given a foretaste of the fire that will be their everlasting abode. Whatever delight they had in the days of their flesh will be eternally forgotten the moment, the instantaneous moment they arrive in the lake of fire. Whatever they meted out to the saints of God while on earth will be returned on their heads a thousand times over the very instant they are thrown into the bottomless gulf of brimstone. And those who wish to be rid of the doctrine of eternal sufferings should not utilize their precious time on earth arguing against God, against the doctrine of eternal punishment. But instead, they should use the precious gift of time that they have to seek the reconciliation that God has offered in the gospel. God says, don't debate with me about eternal destruction. Instead, use that time, friends. Use that time to seek reconciliation with Christ. Again, from the city of God in Augustine, but eternal punishment seems hard and unjust to human perceptions because of the weakness of our moral condition, there is a wanting that highest and purest wisdom by which it can perceive how great wickedness was committed in the first transgression. The more enjoyment man found in God, the greater was his wickedness in abandoning him. And he who destroyed in himself a good which might have been eternal became worthy of eternal evil. I want you to notice that the devil is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, as prior we had read that his two emissaries, the beast of the sea, Rome, and the beast of the land, apostate Israel, had also been thrown into the lake of fire. The beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, the false prophet is apostate Judaism, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast. Nero, and those who had worshipped its image, that's Colossus Neronus, but these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And again, this is why I tell you I'm sympathetic with those who read into the world language throughout the book of Revelation, because the parallel throwing of Rome and the apostate Israel into the lake of fire that was done in the first century. That same language is used at the end of the millennia age when Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and burning soul. But prior, the spiritual warfare described the victory that God had had over Rome, the beast of the sea, and the false prophet, apostate Judaism. So too now John is going to describe the end of Satan's deceptive work. This is going to open the way for the following chapters 21 and 22 of the restoration of the pristine conditions found in the Garden of Eden and better. As I told you, we have a Bible with no devil on the first page and no devil on the last page. Now here's an important point. New Jerusalem and the new world that John will describe in the consummated chapters of Revelation 21 and 22 exist even now, definitively and progressively. What is Christ doing now? He's making us new creations in Christ Jesus. But recall, not only did mankind fall in the fall, but also nature itself was subjected to the humiliation of sin entering into it, and that nature itself will be, as it were, resurrected unto new life again. What does Paul write to the Corinthians? Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new. And so even now, as the preaching of the gospel is going out, God is enlivening the world. And as the prophecies of Ezekiel tell us very plainly, there is a day coming in which the waters will issue out from the temple of God, the idea of the gospel going out from the church. And that gospel is going to enliven the world. Christianity is that leavening effect working its way in the whole world towards a better day ahead. And though, as Peter says, for a little while we suffer, we need to confess such a theology that says though suffering is part of our story now, it will not always be so. Though
though the railings of wicked men is part of our story now, it will not always be so. We look forward to that better day ahead. God's tabernacle dwells with man in all evil, and the curse that came along with it is banished from God's earth. This will occur when the devil is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone to be ever tormented. And as the ages roll like a great wheel, never to be worn down by the endless ages that shall come, that wicked and malevolent spirit will be tormented along with the beast and all who took his mark and the false prophet. This malevolent spirit who has succeeded in having our first parents expelled from their garden, beautiful garden home and made a multitude of attempts to prevent the seed of the woman from ever being born from all of his attacks on Judah. And once the promised seed was born, what does he do in Bethlehem? He causes the jealousy of Herod the Great to attack the innocents and to kill the young children in and around Bethlehem. But that promised seed of the woman was born and did accomplish every work of his sending father. And now he sits enthroned as the king of heaven and earth, and on this great day, spoken of in the prophecy, Christ Jesus will bring a fiery conclusion to the tyranny of the devil. And friends, that's good news for you. That the tyranny of the devil will not last forever. Let's consider the verses 11 through 15, the great white throne of judgment. John introduces this next vision with his classic introduction, and I saw. John sees Almighty God seated upon the great white throne. And we simply ought to accept it as a common theme in the Bible, everywhere demonstrated. God is glorified in the judgment of the wicked. We see it in the Psalms. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. The cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits in throne forever. He has established his throne for justice. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. And so we see it as a common thing throughout the scriptures. God is glorified in the judgment of the wicked. And in response to this awe-inspiring scene, all of nature is seeking to flee away. Nature reeling from the presence of God is a common theme in the Psalms. See it in Psalm 18, 77, 114. From the judgment of Almighty God, there is no place to hide. No, not in the sea. No, not even in death and hell. This is taught throughout the scriptures. For example, in the Old Testament, from Daniel. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at the, that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. We're going to hear very similar language in our text today. And many of those who sleep in the dust of earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. The same thing is taught in the New Testament, again by the Apostle Paul. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Remember, one resurrection moment, one judgment event. And so the slumbering sinner is awakened out of the earth with the blast of the trumpet and the shout of the Son of God to now come trembling before the tribunal of God. The resurrection period described is also taught by the Apostle Paul. To the Thessalonians he wrote, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. The books are now open. The fierce God who dwells in unapproachable light scans the book of life does not find the name of the one who thought himself too clever for Jesus. That once exalted Nimrod has now been reduced to a trembling shell of a person. At this moment, all of his wicked deeds and misspoken words and unclean thoughts are laid before him. And he has 
no fault to open his mouth in defense. During the days of his flesh, our sinner had deceived himself, thinking he should say this or other that in his defense. Should there be a judge, I will gladly tell him what a remarkable man I have been. But amidst the peals of thunder and blasting of the trumpets and shouting of the myriads of angels and untold billions of the redeemed, all that foolish boasting is forgotten. Fear and desperation grips every soul of his being. There's a tight grip about his throat and a ringing in his ears as he waits what he knows to be a just sentence. Behold, now the trembling mass of sinners now separated to the left of Almighty God. The book of life is brought forward to Almighty God, and he places his finger upon the page and begins to scan for names. The names of the great mass are not found. And oh, how they scream and cry out, and cry out all together so that none can distinguish what one is shouting above the other, a mass of mingled voices seeking to cry out above their neighbor. But the common theme of all their yelling is, look again, look again, look again. Is it truly the case that my name is nowhere to be found in your book? And I am finished. Oh, look again. Surely my name must be somewhere in your book. But with one whooshing motion, the book is slammed shut, and they must now be judged by their works. I wish to make this theological point, a distinction, though salvation is never based upon human works. Damnation is absolutely based upon human works. Having no Savior to take away the curse of the law, the wicked lie exposed for every misdeed, every misspoken word, and every vain thought. The thoroughness of that moment's exposure causes the wicked to know that God's judgment upon them is altogether just. Edwards wrote, How much will it be for their conviction when they shall hear the sentence and condemnation pronounced to reflect with themselves how often hath this same person who now passes sentence of condemnation upon me called me in his word and by his messenger accept him and give myself to him. How often he knocked at the door of my heart and had it not been for my own folly and obstinacy, how might I have had him for my Savior who is now my incensed judge. He who spurned a father's prayers and mocked a mother's tears has forced his way downward against all the advantages mercy had supplied. Sentence of condemnation is uttered from the throne, and all at once a mighty angel grabs up the sinner and bids him look down, down, down to the abyss where he hears the sullen moans and hollow groans and screams of tortured spirits. He knows that he shrieks, but he cannot hear his own voice. The tortured souls coming out of the pit swallows up his mightiest cry. Jesus, during the days of his flesh, spoke a parable of a man that knew he was about to be removed as manager master's house. And so what did he do? He went about town seeking to ingratiate himself to other well-established businessmen. If you owe my master a hundred measures of oil, pay him fifty. If you owe him a hundred measures of wheat, pay him eighty. And Jesus commends at least the shrewdness of the man who was willing to do anything, anything to maintain earthly employment. What's the spiritual teaching of this? Jesus says, what kind of fool would not use similar shrewdness, similar anxiety to make sure that you avoid the pit of fire and gain heaven? Alas, all those who carelessly delay must go to that place of unquenchable fire where the worm dies not and a fixed and impassable gulf exists and the righteous. Those who would not voluntarily share in the first resurrection of spiritual regeneration are compelled to share in the second resurrection of judgment. The sinner who once lived comfortably and said to himself, I will hear the gospel at a more convenient season. Having delayed, struck down in his youth, in the prime of his vigor, he went down to a graceless grave only to be raised to a merciless resurrection. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is described in accordance with the Apostle Paul's teaching. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. Let me stop and say, friends, I do not know how to hear that other than optimistically. I do not understand how you can read the Apostle Paul in St. John's Revelation have a pessimistic eschatology. That last enemy to be destroyed.
destroyed is death. Well, today I will close with this happy thought. Death is a foreign intruder in God's created order. Recall that sin had ushered in death, and thus our first parents, Garden Home, was rendered off limits by the flaming sword of the cherubim. But here in this glorious text, sin is vanquished, and along with it, its companion of death. And just as sin has had ushered Eden off the pages of Scripture in the first few chapters of the Bible, so death and sin and death will be reintroduced, will it reintroduce in Eden in our last two chapters when sin and death are ushered off. Eden is going to be ushered back on the last two chapters of the Bible. This is God's teaching for us today. May we humbly receive it. Amen. I ask you to stand to receive God's blessing.